Okay, we're going to start um, this lecture on energy. And the first thing we're going to cover in this lecture is the first law of or thermodynamics, um, which states that energy is conserved. So you cannot get more energy out of a substance than was originally put in. Let's think about a plant. So a plant absorbs a certain amount of energy from sunlight, and it uses this to make chemical bonds. The energy is stored in the, ener or the chemical bonds by the plant. When we eat the plant, we burn it for fuel. The energy is released as we break down the chemical bonds. The amount of energy we got out of the plant can never be more than the amount of energy from the sunlight that went into the plant. So amount of energy produced by plant can never be more than energy put into plant by sun. The amount of energy produced by the plant can never be more than energy put into the plant by sun. Okay, so you also see this with light bulbs. Um, so electrical en energy goes into a light bulb, either from a power plant or from a battery. The light bulb gives off energy in the form of light and heat. It cannot give mo off more energy than is put into it. If the battery goes dead or the electricity supply is cut off, the light bulb will stop giving off energy. So this brings us to the second law of thermodynamics, um, which says that we can never get all of the energy out of a system that we put in. Okay, so never get all of the energy that is put into a system. So, all right, let's go back to this plant example. A plant absorbs energy from the sun and converts it into chemical bonds. When we eat the plant, we recover some of the energy and use that for our metabolism. However, in the process of breaking down the plant, some of the energy is lost, usually as heat. Um, the amount of energy we get out will always be less than 100% of the sunlight energy that went into the plant. So, amount of energy obtained will always be less than sun energy put in. Okay, another example is when you burn gasoline in your car. Much of the energy goes into moving your car forward. However, some will be lost due to friction between metal pieces in the engine, tires in the road, etc. The lost energy is seen as heat. Your engine heats up, your tires are warm after driving. This energy cannot be recovered. The heat energy contributes to disorder. The molecules are moving around faster. Eventually, billions of years, the energy will be lost into space and there will be no le energy left to carry out the chemical phys or physical process. So sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the heat death of the university. Or, or the, not the university, the universe. Blah. So, um, second law of thermo thermodynamics. Um, energy, or you can never get out all the, all the energy that you put into a system. This is because disorder is increasing. So the second law of thermodynamics. Um, my high school chemistry teacher, Mrs. Mood, who I loved to death, um, she had a very messy desk. And she, despite that, she was still an excellent teacher. You know, don't let that Think, make you think less of her. Um, but I always chuckled because her desk um, had a sticker on it that said, you know, this, my desk obeys the second law of 
thermodynamics. And um, I definitely feel like that sometimes, you know, with my desk and um, <laughs> my children's play areas. But um, second law of thermodynamics, disorder is increasing. So we're never going to be able to get all of the energy out of a system that was put in. Um, okay, one more example of this. Uh, if you try to leave the refrigerator door open in order to cool down a room, the refrigerator will cool the air inside of it, and when you open the door, you get cool air. However, the refrigerator motor has to work in order to cool down the air. The motor gives off heat. The amount of heat given off by the motor is more than the cold air um, produced by the refrigerator. So leaving the refrigerator door open will give off more heat than cold. Okay, so we've covered the first and second law of thermodynamics. Now we're going to talk about electricity. Electricity is the flow of electrons. So electricity is very convenient for transferring energy. Um, so in the 19th century, coal, gas, and oil were used for energy, so heating, lighting, but the transport of the fuel was difficult and costly, and also kind of dangerous. It's not that often that you hear of fires um, in houses due to electrical wiring. It's not that you don't hear of them. I had a friend that had a house fire due to that, but um, you hear a lot more of fires that were caused by um, oil lamps getting knocked over, you know, that type of thing. So curtains catching on fire. Um, so it's definitely a lot safer and more convenient than previously used. Um, so electricity can be produced by wrapping a coil of wire around a magnet. When the magnet is rotated, electrons in the coil of the wire move in response to the changing magnetic field. This produces electricity. That's pretty cool. So, um, this, the magnet is connected to a turbine, a set of paddle wheels around a shaft. The vanes of the turbine can be turned by water flow. So you can use wind to generate electricity. You can use water. Um, you can use steam. Um, so a lot of times steam is used like at, at power plants. Okay, so let's talk about the definition of energy. Energy is defined as the ability to do work. Um, there are several different units for energy. One joule is equal to one kilogram. This is the SI unit, one joule. Um, kilogram times meter squared per second squared. So the amount of work to move one kilogram of mass for one meter at an acceleration of one meter per second squared. Um, one calorie equals 4.184 joules. One large calorie equals 1,000 little calories. Um, British thermal unit equals 1,055 joules. And one BTU equals the amount of energy to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degrees Fahrenheit. And then one horsepower equals 1.34 kilowatts. It's a capital W if you can't tell. Okay, lowercase k. 
and add this definition power no oh, wait a second like that shouldn't be a unit of energy that's a unit of power um, we'll copy that down next okay um, power is defined as the amount of energy used in a period of time. The amount of energy used in a period of time. So I know you think, gosh, these definitions. The definitions are important and um, help you with your understanding of energy. And they are covered on the exam. That's why I take time to go over the definitions. Um, so the power is the amount of energy used in a period of time. Units for power, I had mistakenly put horsepower up here. Um, so a watt is a joule per second, which makes sense because energy has units of joules. So power is the amount of energy used in a period of time, joule per second. Okay, um, a light bulb gives off a certain amount of energy each second. A 100 watt light bulb uses twice as much energy as a 50 watt light bulb. So one kilowatt equals 1,000 watts. You guys knew that. Um, and one horsepower equals 1.34 kilo. Um, so the horsepower was established in the late 18th century um, by using strong dray horses. It is about 50% greater than the rate that can be sustained by the average horse over a working day. Often, and this is applicable to you guys when you pay your electricity bill, the amount of energy a household uses is measured in kilowatt hours. So this is measuring power. The power in terms of kilowatts being used is multiplied by the number of hours used. So let's say you have 10 light bulbs in your house at 100 watts each. That would use up one kilowatt, 10 times 100, 1,000 watts, one kilowatts. If those 10 light bulbs are left on for an hour, one kilowatt of, hour of energy is used up. So the next time you pay your energy bill, look at the units. You might recognize kilowatt hours. Okay, so. Now we're going to talk about some sources of energy. So you hear about fossil fuels and, you know, there's a lot of debate lately with um, political campaigns and fuel comes up a lot. So a fossil fuel comes from animals and plants that died millions of years ago and were buried under rocks. So, um, comes from animals and plants that died millions of years ago. So it's the carbon in these animals and plants. So carbon from animals and plants turns into coal, oil, and natural gas. So carbon from animals and plants turns into coal, oil, and natural gas. Um, then these are burned to produce energy. And one of the drawbacks of using fossil fuels is that they're not renewable. These are animals and plants that died millions of years ago. Well, we're not going to be able to just quickly convert these, you know, other animals and plants that have died millions of years ago, it's going to take time. So um, that is an important thing to consider with these fossil fuels. They're not renewable. Okay, so the thing about fossil fuels is they contain a lot of energy because they contain a lot of carbon. So um, 
contain a lot of energy. This is more than wood. Okay, so coal is a fossil fuel. This is a solid form of carbon. Most coal contains small amounts of other substances, sulfur and other elements. So solid form of element carbon contains trace sulfur and other elements. Okay, so it can be burned, it can be burned to give off heat and carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Industrially, this Heat is used to boil water to make steam, which can be used to turn turbines and generate electricity. So it can be burned to produce heat, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide. Um, this is used to boil water, which can then turn turbines, which can then generate electricity. So if you've ever gone skiing, um, there's a skiing place called Snow Creek, not that far away from here, and there is a energy plant not that far away. Um, and you can see just this tremendous smoke cloud, just as this white smoke cloud. At first, I thought it was clouds, you know, like, wow, there's so many clouds in the sky. It is actually just the carbon dioxide um, being given off by the burning of coal to produce steam, which then generates electricity. So um, this is how we get our electricity from coal. And what's interesting, and my, my son is nuts for trains. Um, is there is a, a huge railroad that goes right up to this power plant and there are just boxcars upon boxcars full of coal. So uh, just, I mean, so many tons of coal burned each day to produce the steam, to produce the energy to power your light bulbs in your house. Um, so it's something that we take for granted that you know our electricity is produced by plants you know it used to be not that long ago that if you wanted to cook in your kitchen you had to go get um, the fuel you had to go get the charcoal yourself or the coal yourself and then you know you had to light it you had to maintain it if you wanted to make light your room you had to get the kerosene oil to put in your lamps so it's it's funny how we've kind of gotten removed from these energy processes um, but important to think about and important to think about for our future and our children's future and their children's future um, so coal is abundant um, it is estimated that there are 10 times as much coal available as petroleum and natural gas combined it is straightforward to obtain and use and it's also easy to transport Abundant, easy to transport. So it is a solid, and it does take a lot of energy to get it out of the ground and transparent, transport it to a power plant. It must be dug out of the ground, and so there are some not so desirable side effects of that. So solid, dug, out of ground um, can lead to environmental problems.
So um, I had a friend who, um, I grew up in Virginia, and one of my friends lived in West Virginia, and coal mining is very common there. And her dad was a coal miner. And um, there are a lot of unpleasant side effects of being a coal miner. Um, you know, a lot of miners have difficulty breathing because of the particulate matter that's generated all the time and they're inhaling this. It can be problematic for their lung function. Um, so w another thing with coal is that burning coal produces air pollution. Um, remember that coal contains sulfur and some nitrogen compounds and when these compounds are given off as gases they combine with water and the acid and and the atmosphere to produce acid rain so sulfur nitrogen make acid rain okay so the other thing that coal does is it produces many small particles when it's burned to contribute to air pollution. It can be purified by mixing it with water. Um, so they can be mixed with water. But in, inevitably, it leads to making the use of coal more expensive. So, so there are ways that you can filter um, and purify, make the air cleaner when you burn coal. Uh, so So some of this air can be passed through a filter to prevent particulates and acid rain. Okay. But the next time you see a train, which I'm always notified when our kids see trains, right? When they're driving like, there's a train! Um, look in the train. Look at the contents of the train. I would say about 85 to 90 percent of the time you see a train, it's full of coal. And most likely that coal is headed off to a power plant. So just think about that. All right. Um, the next one, petroleum. This is also a fossil fuel. Um, petroleum is a mixture of several carbon containing compounds. Carbon is what makes all of us up. We're made of lots of carbon atoms. Uh, your DNA, um, proteins, everything. Carbon is, is, is a huge part of you. Carbon is a huge part of plants as well. Um, so that's why the decay of animals and plants that have died millions of years ago, it's just this rich source of carbon. Um, so with coal, it's a solid form of the element carbon. Petroleum has a mixture of several carbon containing compounds. So um, one to four carbons are gases, five to 12 carbons. Um, when I say they're gases, that's the form that they take, one to four carbons. Um, methane, ethane, propane, and butane are the alkanes that are one to four carbons in length. And when you buy those, you're going to buy them in a gas tank. If you find um, carbon-containing compounds that are 5 to 12 carbons in length, those are going to be liquids. Um, think of your gasoline. That usually is a mixture of octane. So octane has 8 carbons. Molecules with 12 to 16 carbons. Um, are used, it depends on the arrangement, but these are used as jet fuel and kerosene. So this is one to four carbons, gases, it's used for heating, um, five to 12 carbons used for fuel and automobiles. A lot of this has to do with how convenient it is. Think of how difficult it would be to transfer a gas from a pump, like 
when I say gas, I mean a, a gas in that form, like not a liquid, but a gas, like from a gas tank, a pressurized gas tank to your gas tank, gasoline tank. It would be very difficult um, because the gas would escape into the air. Um, so that's why liquids are used um, for fuel and automobiles. Um, so molecules with 16 or more carbons are thick solids. Think of like petroleum jelly. Um, and they're you're more used as oils and lubricants. Okay, so petroleum burns in the air, reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. Much petroleum contains impurities that contribute to air pollution and acid rain when burned. And complete burning leads to a substantial amounts of smoke and soot as well. So this can um, contrib contribute to acid rain. That's the sulfur nitrogen impurities and then air pollution. Um, Okay, so it can be, petroleum can be found trapped under layers of rock and requires drilling in order to obtain it. Um, so, you know, if you go down to Wichita and you see um, they're pumping for oil, they're, they're trying to get that petroleum out. Um, so it can be pumped to the surface and then transported to refineries which separate out the different fractions of petroleum. It's easier to, to obtain and transport than solid coal. Okay, so... The nice thing about petroleum is that you don't have a coal miner in a mine risking their lives to get this solid coal out. They're just, you know, they have this machinery that can pump the petroleum out. So gasoline is obtained from petroleum. By itself, it does not burn very smoothly in a car and must be modified chemically. Branched molecules burn more smoothly than straight chains of carbon atoms. So, um, used for cars, branched carbons burn smoother than straight chains. Okay, so if you have a straight chain, you might get knocking. So, uh, but branched molecules burn more easily, do not cause knocking in the engine. It was later discovered that you could add lead in the form of tetraethyl lead, also made gasoline burn more smoothly. But the problem with lead is it led to a lot of, and I don't mean to play on words on that, it led to a lot of problems with um, air pollution, this lead being released into the air. You hear about lead paint, so why would you want to put lead in your gasoline? <laughs> because that is going to make the air quality much worse. So um, lead Um, added to gasoline burns smoother bad for air bad for people around it so when you look um, you know, this is kind of old school you see unleaded gasoline so there used to be leaded gasoline and unleaded gasoline not that long ago so we keep learning all these different things about the chemicals, how they interact with us in our lungs, and how they can impact us. So um, most petroleum is burned for energy. So if you listen to the polymers lecture, um, you know, a lot of plastics, all the plastics are made from petroleum. And many of the plastics we used are thrown, are thrown away 
and all of this petroleum, all these fuels that we're talking about, they're just burned and they're gone. And a lot of people think that's a shame to waste all these carbons, especially because they're not a renewable resource. So most petroleum is burned for energy. However, about 6% is used to produce plastic. Um, I don't even know if you can read this, sorry. So 6% of petroleum used for plastic. So all of the plastic that we use every day, which if you think about how much you come into contact with plastics, it's pretty prolific. You go to the store, you buy a package of cheese. What's the cheese wrapped in? Plastic. You take this your groceries and you put them into a plastic bag. You get into your car, which has plastic. You think about all the moldable plastic that's in cars now. Um, you know, uh, you drink a bottle of water, it's in a plastic container. So those, those plastics were obtained from petroleum fuel. And then your car is using petroleum. You're just burning it. Once that's not going to be made into plastics, it has been converted into energy to make your car go forward. So, um, you know, th it's interesting all the different things you know, how we use energy. Um, and if you think about not that long ago, it used to be horses where our our form of transportation and you couldn't get that like a 15 mile trip was a huge deal with horses and the carriages and the roads and the t the wheels the wagon wheels and all these different things and then like you, we have air pollution with all the petroleum and gasoline that we use and the coal that's burned to make electricity for our houses it's often easy to forget about the pollution that results from horses there used to be a lot of problems, sanitary issues with horses on streets. And then if the horse went to the bathroom, you have this, you know, horse poop, for lack of a better word, that's in the middle of the street. And so that has to be cleared up. And then there has to be sanitation. And there has to be some sort of regulation. So, you know, it, you, there's always something whether you use horses for transportation, whether you use petroleum, whether you use these cars. and So just trying to get you thinking. Okay, let's talk about natural gas. Natural gas is usually methane, which is CH4. Um, <clears throat> methane by itself has no smell. Most natural gas companies add a small amount of sulfur-containing compounds so that it can be smelled. And it's a very small amount. So this is what is used to heat your house. Used to heat homes. Okay? Uh, so methane burns in the air um, to form water vapor and carbon dioxide. Natural gas is rarely pure methane. So usually there are several impurities mixed with it. As the impurities burn, they contribute to air pollution. So methane plus O2 forms H2O and carbon dioxide plus other impurities. These impurities contribute to air pollution. Okay, um, it has fewer impurities than coal or oil, so that's why you hear it is like the clean energy, and it produces less carbon dioxide than either car coal or carbon, and that has to do with the number of carbons, because um, oil has a lot more carbon, so it's going to produce more CO2. Um, okay. Natural gas is buried under rock formations. If you listen to my water lecture, when I was talking about drilling for water or um, drilling for wells to get to the aquifers, um, so you used to have to dig, 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 dig deep down in the earth to get to the point where you have reached a water-saturated ground, which would be the aquifer, and then you have your well. So sometimes people had to dig like 100 feet into the ground. Well, the problem is, and 
I say well, like no play on words there. The problem is that there could be methane trapped under this rock that you're digging in and methane could suffocate you. So a lot of people would light a candle when they were digging their well and they would lower it down. And this, if you read the Little House on the Prairie series, this, they discuss this. So Pa would always light a candle before he was digging this well and um, he would lower it down and if it stayed burning and came back up, then he would um, know that it was okay because there was oxygen. In order for that candle to burn, there had to be oxygen. Now, if he lowered the candle and it went out, it means there's no oxygen there. So it's likely that there was methane. So um, one of his friends who's helping dig the well uh, passes out because they didn't do the candle trick that day because his friend thought, oh, you're crazy, Ingalls, you don't need to do this. Well, he was lucky to be alive. So, um, so it's found trapped under rocks. Um, it's used for heating. Um, and it's also used in manufacturing plastics and polymers. Um, so if you ever smell that smell, and I'll, I'll say the sulfur is added. because methane is odorless. If you ever smell that smell in your house, um, call your gas company right away. Uh, it is an emergency. So the other thing um, that I'll, I'll go off on a little tangent. When you burn natural gas, when you combine it with oxygen in the presence of your furnace, you get um, CO2 and Carbon monoxide is a side product. So if your furnace, if you don't get your furnace checked regularly, your furnace could be operating improperly and it could be producing more carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide will kill you. Um, carbon dioxide is okay, but carbon monoxide takes over um, your oxygen, so and hemoglobin, so it fits perfectly. So if you're in a house that the furnace hasn't been checked very often, um, it could be producing carbon monoxide and you wouldn't even know it unless you have a carbon monoxide detector. It's very important that you have a carbon monoxide detector because um, sometimes it happens. I had some good friends of mine, they didn't get their furnace checked a few years and they thought, oh, we don't need to do that. They have a family of eight and they almost all died because they, they were sitting around one night and they were just kind of getting dizzy, real sleepy. And then the dad said, something's not right. And his wife said, I feel sick. I feel like I'm going to throw up. And then he went outside the house, and he started feeling better, and he called 911 immediately, and they were able to save that family. So something to keep in mind with natural gas. It's wonderful. It burns cleanly. It's very convenient. Um, but it, it can be dangerous. So get a carbon monoxide detector and make sure you get your furnished serviced regularly. Um, another type of fuel that's a gas is propane. So if you grill out and you like the gas grill, and then that canister is propane, and propane has three carbons. So um, there you go. All right. So that concludes our fossil fuels. We're going to go on to some other sources of energy, which can be considered pretty controversial. Nuclear fission um, involves a large nucleus breaking apart and releasing energy. Breaking apart a large nucleus produces tons of energy. So this is a nuclear reaction. Okay, nuclear fission reactions occur in nuclear reactors. The nuclear reaction releases energy as heat, which is used to boil water and create steam. The steam vapors then turn blades of turbines, which generate electricity. So instead of using coal, 
the nuclear reactions are the source of energy, which generate steam, which turn the turbines, which generate energy, which generate electricity. There are some advantages to nuclear power. It does not contribute to air pollution the way that burning fossil fuels does. Uh, no air pollution. It can generate a large amount of electricity from a small amount of fuel. So, uh, Okay, the disadvantages of nuclear power. This is a nuclear reaction. So shielding of the reactor is essential. Any breakdown in the shielding will re release radiation. So, so this is advantages, disadvantages, um, nuclear radiation. So if there's any breakdown, then exposure to nuclear radiation would result. An accident can have catastrophic consequences and with substantial loss of life. The waste products that are formed from radioactive um, materials must be disposed of properly. So nobody wants to take their nuclear waste. So the other concern with nuclear fission is that theft of radioactive material can be used to make weapons. Um, fuel can be used for nuclear weapons. Okay, so we don't have that many um, power plants that are powered by nuclear fission, but in Europe they're used a lot more. The other nuclear um, energy generation is through fusion. So this is two smaller nuclei joined together to create a larger nucleus. Joining together of small nuclei a larger nucleus. This process produces lots of energy too, just like fission. This is what happens in the sun. The energy of the sun comes from nuclear fusion. Two hydrogen atoms are fused to make a helium atom. Nuclear fusion has advantages. The end product is helium, which does not pose any health or environmental hazards. The fuel needed is available. Um, so it is cheap, readily available, and easy to transport to a reactor. The problem with nuclear fusion is that it has major technical problems. The hydrogen atoms must be heated to millions of degrees in order for the reaction to work. Um, so the disadvantage very hot. So in order for this reaction to work, six to or eight lasers on a small pellet of hydrogen, the amount of energy used was greater than the amount of energy given off in the reaction. So it is not economically feasible at this point. So requires a lot of energy to generate the energy. So at this point, nuclear fusion is not used anywhere besides the sun for us. Um, if you watch movies, you might, and you, like there's some science-y movies that talk about cold fusion and the secrets of cold fusion. It's very appealing to get fusion to occur at a lower temperature. But at this point, fusion has not has not been documented as cold fusion. So um, this concludes our lecture on energy, and I hope that you learned something, maybe a little enjoyable, hopefully. Um, you know, a lot of the 
the different things that we talked about in this lecture. Uh, fossil fuels, the source for fossil fuels. Where do they come from? These plants and animals that died millions of years ago decaying um, in the earth. So these fossil fuels, when they're burned, problem with those fossil fuels is they create a lot of air pollution. They create um, acid rain. Um, okay, we talked about nuclear fission. Um, one of the problems with fission is waste. Uh, we talked about similarities between fission and fusion. They both produce lots of energy, which is great. But um, at this point, I think it's unlikely that in the United States we would use a lot of fission um, just because there's a lot of concern over it. Anytime you say nuclear, and people get scared. With good reason, Seven Mile Island, there have been some accidents, Chernobyl. Um, so definitely something to think about. So um, maybe you're thinking more about energy now, just how you know we generate energy, and I hope, hope that's the case. For Unit 5, remember that you need to pick two of the four options. Um, so there's air, water, energy, and polymers. Just pick two of those. When you take your exam um, online, you can take them at different, you don't have to take them at the same time. Let's say you just finished studying for energy, then you're going to do the problems, and then you take the exam. You don't have to take the next exam at the same point. Um, it will be a little bit until your exam five is recorded in the gradebook. So if you take the unit five exam, if you take one of them, for instance, if you take energy, I will not be able to enter your unit five grade until you've taken the second unit five option. So I have to have them both together. I take them both together and average them so you get your grade. Um, so if you're wondering, I took, I took the energy exam. I don't know why it's not posted. Why is it not working? That's the reason why. So you need to have both of them taken and then I'll go through you know, every few days and check that. So um, do your problems, do the practice quizzes with energy, and I will see you next time. Take care.